Hello everyone, Shavua Tov, Chodesh Tov, and welcome back to our series of Tehillah Fractured World on the teachings of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Zatal uh, in conjunction with HaChebran HaKekan Graf. Today we are delighted to have with us Rabbi Danny Mervis. Uh, Rabbi Danny Mervis recently, about six months ago, finished a tenure of about six years as Senior Rabbi of Mizrahi in Melbourne. And uh, as part of his role there, he served in several other uh, roles in the community in Melbourne, Australia, uh, as Vice President of the Rabbinical Council in Victoria, uh, as part of the Hebra Kadisha, as part of the Melbourne Era of Community and uh, the Kosher Australia, and uh, as well as serving in rabbinic leadership roles for the various communities, shuls, uh, the school Libli Yavne College and B'nai Akiva across the community. Uh, he returned in 2021, uh, last year, to assume the position here at Wal Mizrahi as our Deputy CEO. I mean, without any further ado, uh, Danny, delighted to welcome you to speak. Thank you, Daniel, for your warm words of introduction. It is a pleasure to, get, to work together with you and the tremendous team here in Yerushalayim in the leadership of World Mizrahi, of course, led by our inspiring chairman and CEO, Rabbi Doron Perez. Um, for all of us to work alongside Rabbi Perez is a tremendous privilege, and uh, it is an honor for me to be giving this evening's or morning or afternoon, depending where you are in the world, lecture as part of this Rabbi Sachs series. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our partners in the organization of this series, Israel Kristal of HaChevra Lecheke HaMikra, uh, people who've done uh, tremendous work in spreading the Torah and teachings of Rabbi Sachs in Hebrew in the land of Israel, and they've partnered with us on this series. I'd like to thank Rabbi Reuven Tarragon, the Educational Director of World Mizrahi, together with Rabbi Nitshani Tarragon, for uh, masterminding this series and doing such a tremendous job, um, not only in uh, bringing top quality speakers for this series, but everything he does for World Mizrahi, at the moment, he's in America, having spent an inspirational weekend there together with dozens of World Mizrahi speakers as part of our Israel 360 program, where speakers from Israel are addressing crowds at hundreds of communities across the world in this month of Iyar. That's also another one of Rabbi Tarragon's tremendous projects, and it's a tremendous privilege to be working alongside him. I'd like to thank Daniel Cohen, uh, Susan, and the team at World Mizrahi. Um, for doing such tremendous work in the organization around this series. And uh, I'd also like to say hello to Johnny Lipser of the Rabbi Sachs Legacy Trust, who's joined us this evening as well. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Rabbi Sachs uh, on many occasions uh, during the time where I lived in London and even a little bit before then as well. And um, I'd like to think when we have a series such as this, with the teachings of Rabbi Sachs that not only are we achieving the goal of spreading his Torah and perpetuating his legacy and learning in his memory, but I've got a picture in my mind of Rabbi Sachs smiling with that special smile of his, knowing that his Torah is being taught in this way through the World Mizrahi organization, which was so close to his heart. I know that the Sachs family are very much aware of this series and are touched by it. And uh, I'd like to think that Rabbi Sachs himself as well um, would enjoy the thought um, that we are learning together in this way. The topic I've chosen for us this evening is of love and hate. That indeed was one of the topics of Rabbi Sachs's covenant and conversation pieces on this week's parasha. Well, for those of us in Israel, it was yesterday's parasha of Kedoshim, and for those in the diaspora, it's going to be next week's parasha. And what I've uh, brought together for us to learn together this evening is a number of lessons from Rabbi Sachs's writings on Parshat Kedoshim in covenant conversation from the years 5767, 5773, 5774, and uh, most recently, one which was put out in 5781, together with a quote from Faith in the Future, looking at some common themes in his writings on this week's parasha, uh, together with what I believe would be the major messages. If we were to learn the teachings of Rabbi Sachs on Parashat Kedoshim, what would he want us to be learning? I think if we look at the overview of what he's written over the years, 
perhaps. Um, these are the points he would like us to focus on. And I've now shared my screen together with you. And we're gonna commence with the way Rabbi Sachs sets the scene for the mitzvah we're gonna be focusing on today. It's a really beautiful description, the way in which he's able to zoom out and just paint a picture of where we are at any particular point in the Torah. And he wrote as follows, at the center of the mosaic, of the mosaic books is Vayikra. At the center of Vayikra is the holiness code. In chapter 19, with its momentous call, you shall be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. That is the commencement of Prashat Kedoshim. And at the center of chapter 19 is a brief paragraph, which by its positioning is the apex, the high point of the Torah. So we're in the book of Vayikra, which is the middle of the five books of the Torah. We're in the middle of that book in chapter 19, in the middle of that chapter. Here we are at the high point of the Torah. And what is the apex of the Torah? Psukim, which are well known to us. Lotisna etachicha bilvavecha. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Hocheach tochiach et amitecha. You shall surely remonstrate with your fellow. And you shall not bear sin as the result of him. And our major focus this evening is going to be on this term. You shall surely remonstrate with your fellow. And then in the following verse, you should not take vengeance. Velotitor et mecha, nor should you bear a grudge against the members of your people. The avtalarecha kamocha, ani Hashem, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Hashem. Now, when it comes to these sukim, each pasuk starts off with a negative, followed by a positive. It commences in the negative. Lotisnae tachicha bilvavecha. Don't hate your brother in your heart. But then we're given a positive action. You shall surely remonstrate with him. Similarly, in the following pasuk, we're told in the negative, Lotikom, Velotitor, do not revenge and do not bear a grudge with the people, with the members of your people. Rather, as we know, the Avtalarecha Kamocha Ani Hashem. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am Hashem. Now, what is the situation in which we are called to fulfill the mitzvah of hocheach tocheach et amitecha? You shall surely remonstrate with your fellow. What is the setting? What is the scene here? What are the circumstances in which we are expected to go and remonstrate with others? What are we talking about here? And Rabbi Sachs pointed out how both in Ramban, Nachmanides, and Ramban, Maimonides, two separate levels of this mitzvah appear. If we look at Ramban, Nachmanides, we see the first level as follows. Ramban wrote, one moment, just a second, please. Um, just going to see if I can help. No, sorry, I'm not quite sure what to do there, but I'll try and place the sources at the top of the screen in order to avoid any uh, blockage to the site if anybody's unable to see the sources. So Ramban says as follows. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. What's the situation? Generally speaking, when people hate other individuals, they keep it to themselves. Therefore, Va'amar, it says, don't keep it in your heart. Rather, you shall remonstrate with that other fellow. Mitzvah acheret, this is giving us a separate command from simply not hating, 
which is it's teaching us that you have to approach that individual and we need to remonstrate with them and get them to try to correct their ways. As a result, if we remonstrate with them, you will not bear sin as a result of them. If somebody else sins and you disapprove and you keep that disapproval to yourself, you yourself are going to be guilty for that which they do. Here we are talking about a collective responsibility. When somebody else sins, I am personally responsible for the sins of other people. That is one setting of this. The person may not know who I am. They might not know that I exist. They might not know that I am aware at all of that which is taking place. Nevertheless, it says, Hocheach tocheach et amitecha, I must remonstrate with that individual. So that is the first setting, the setting of collective responsibility. When somebody else sins, if I do not respond, I become responsible. We then reach the second level. Vahanachon be'enai. Ramban says, that which I believe to be the correct understanding is as follows. Ki hocheyach tocheyach. This mitzvah of remonstrating with others is as follows. Don't hate your brother in your heart. When he does something to you that you yourself do not want. Now we're talking about an interaction between two individuals. And one person does something to the other that they don't like. In such a situation where one person behaves in a way to another that they dislike, don't keep it to yourself. Rather, you should rebuke them and ask them, why are you doing this to me? Because if you approach them and you remonstrate with them, perhaps they will apologize. Or here there isn't the word perhaps. Or perhaps they're going to do tshuva, they will repent. And they will admit that which they did wrong, the titka per law, and as a result, he will be atoned. Two separate scenes in the Rambam. The first scene is one whereby I see something taking place. It's not necessarily something which is being done to me or against me, but I am responsible if I do not stop that incorrect activity by somebody else. The second setting is where I am personally involved. I myself see what is going on. I myself have been affected by that which is going on. And therefore, I myself shouldn't keep that to myself. Rather, I should remonstrate with the other individual. Uh, I've just been informed, I understand there are some connection issues here in our building. So I'm just going to try and stop the share and re-share. And also I'm going to just reconnect on a different connection in the hope that we aren't going to have this challenge. Just a moment, please. There we go. And... All right, hopefully it'll be better now. If you missed any of that, Rambam Maimonides, Rabbi Sachs says, organizes things in the same way. In Rambam Maimonides as well, we have two different levels. And in Rambam, we have as follows. In source number three. When one person sins against another individual. So here we have the interaction between the two individuals. You shouldn't just quietly hate that individual. It is a mitzvah upon you to inform them. And say to them, Why did you do this and that to me? Why did you sin to me in that way? 
you have to do this because it says in the Torah, you should surely rebuke your fellow. If that person then in turn asks for forgiveness, you must forgive them. The one who's asked to give forgiveness should not be cruel and withhold that forgiveness. So once again, we have a situation whereby one person sins against another individual. That individual should approach them, should remonstrate with them, should let them know that they're upset with that which has taken place in the hope that that interaction would then go and improve the situation. Then we have the second level. In the following halacha in Ramba. When you see somebody else sinning, or they're going in the wrong path. It is a mitzvah to return that individual to the right path and to let them know that he's sinning with that which he's doing with his bad ways. As it says, you should surely remonstrate with your fellow. So again, the mitzvah of tochecha isn't just when somebody does something to me, against me, when interacting with me, but even if it's somebody who I don't know, even if it's somebody who doesn't know me, who may not even know that I'm watching them, Nevertheless, I must remonstrate with that individual. And Rambam goes on to say, when somebody is remonstrating in this way, whether it's to deal with two people interacting, or if it's that a person's relationship with Hashem and you're just watching from the side, you should do it in private. You don't have to do it in front of the whole world. Speak to them gently and with a gentle tone when engaging in that remonstration. So far we have seen, both in Nachmanides and Maimonides, there are two separate levels or two separate arena in which we are expected to remonstrate with others. The first is in an interaction between two individuals where one person does something against another person. And the second is when you're watching from the side. And when it comes to watching from the side, perhaps the best way to describe this is with the parable of the Kliakara by Ephraim Lunches in source number four. And he says, Mashlu Mashal Bazer, they gave a parallel for this. You have one individual on a boat where there are numerous people on that boat. And one individual on the boat starts drilling a hole in the boat, tachtav, beneath themselves. Za'aku alav, kol anshei hasvina. Everybody on the boat started shouting at that individual. Ma ze'ata oseh, what are you doing? Hey shiv lehem, he said to them. Halo tachtai ani kodeach. What difference does it make to you? I'm just drilling a hole under my place. This is my seat on the boat. I bought this seat. Mind your own business. Or this is my cabin. You do whatever you want to do in your cabin, and I'll do whatever I want to do in my cabin. You keep to yourself, and I'm going to keep to myself. Amrullah, they said to that individual, What's wrong with you? When you're drilling a hole in our boat, if water comes underneath you, it endangers us all. The entire boat is going to drown. This is the mitzvah of hocheach tocheach. This is the mitzvah. The mitzvah is telling us that when we see other people doing things wrong, when we see other people going against the way of the Torah, we can't just say, you do what you're going to do, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You can't just do that. Why? Because we are all in the same boat. We are all in the same boat. We are all in this together. And if one person drills a hole under their part of the boat, we are all endangered. So that individual needs to know that they need to be careful with their behavior. And we all need to know that we have a responsibility for other people's behavior as well. Now, having given this background to the mitzvah of hocheach tochiach and the different areas in which it applies, Rabbi Sachs then goes on to teach us about the scope 
of this mitzvah. How far does this go? Who needs to rebuke who? Or who is responsible for the actions of others? Who does this apply to? And now we reach the first lesson from Rabbi Sachs, which is what he calls critical followership. And he wrote as follows. This second interpretation is possible. This being the interpretation that we are responsible for the actions of others, even if it's got nothing to do with me personally. There's no such thing. We're all in the same boat together. That understanding is only possible because of Judaism's fundamental principle that kol Yisrael arevin zeh bazeh. We are all intertwined. All Jews are sureties, i.e. responsible for one another. However, Rabbi Sachs went on to say, the Talmud makes a fascinating observation about the scope of the command. And this observation appears in the Gemara in Baba Metziah, page 31a. And there the Gemara wants to learn from this double term, this double expression, hocheach tocheach. What are we to understand from this double expression? The Gemara goes as follows. Amar lei hahu mirabanan lerava. One of the Rabbanan said to Rava as follows. Ve'ema, let's suggest as follows. Why is there a double expression? Hocheach, the first term means chada zimna once. Tochiach, the second term means tre zimni, even twice. Amalei, he says, no. We're not limiting this to remonstrating twice. Really, the first word in and of itself suggests remonstrating even a hundred times. Rather, what do we learn from the double expression? I only have from the first word the fact that a teacher or the rabbi should remonstrate with the student. Talmid Rav Minai. From where do we know that a student needs to remonstrate with their teacher? When a student sees a teacher doing something wrong, the Torah commands that student to challenge their teacher. Talmud Lomar, hocheach tocheach, mikol makom. The Torah has a double expression, hocheach tocheach. What does that double expression come to teach us? It's not just individuals who are perceived to be responsible who are perceived to be more senior, who are responsible to remonstrate with others, everybody is. Even students are expected and commanded to remonstrate with their teachers. Here we have a lesson, not just in leadership, but here we have a lesson in followership, what it means to be a follower in Judaism. And Rabbi Sachs was a strong believer that to be a follower in Judaism is not a passive activity. Now, this is surprising in the general context, in the way we as Jews revere our teachers. For example, Rabbi Sachs brought the Mishnah in source number six. Rabbi Lazar ben Shalmoa Omer, he said as follows, You should respect and honor your student the way you honor yourself. You should honor your friend the same way that you revere your teacher. We're told in the Mishnah and Avot that we're supposed to approach our teachers, our rabbis, like the fear we have for heaven. We're supposed to revere them, hold them in the same standing, approach them with the same awe as we do for heaven. Nevertheless, Rabbi Sachs taught, despite this, the Talmud understands the Torah to be commanding us to remonstrate even with our teacher or leader, should we see him or her doing something wrong. This is a rather radical learning which is being taught here from the Gemara. It's not just those who are in the know, those who are perceived to be senior, who are expected to remonstrate with others, even students are expected to remonstrate with their teachers. And so Rabbi Sachs went on to say, hence the Talmudic saying, 
V'hainu da Amar Rabbi Chanina. This is what Rabbi Chanina meant. It's what he said as follows. Harbela madati merabotai. I've learned plenty from my teachers. Umichaverai From my friends more than from my teachers. I've learned the most from my students. Why? Because Rabbi Sachs views the role of the student to be to challenge the teacher, to challenge the educator. Rabbi Sachs said it as follows. Therefore, despite the reverence we owe our teachers, we owe them also our best efforts at questioning and challenging their ideas. No one is above criticism and no one too junior to administer it if done with due grace and humility. A disciple may criticize his teacher, a child may challenge a parent, a prophet may challenge a king, and all of us, simply by bearing the name Israel, are summoned to wrestle with God and our fellow humans in the name of the right and the good. Here Rabbi Sachs teaches us how far this mitzvah goes. Nobody is above criticism and nobody is too junior to criticize if it is done with the correct grace and humility. Students have a responsibility, followers have a responsibility to challenge their teachers. Now this concept in the writings of Rabbi Sachs, that Hashem wants us to challenge, as he wrote just now, extends to challenging or wrestling with God. And I'd like to share with you a video now. This video came out soon after Rabbi Sachs passed away, it uh, went somewhat viral or maybe just before he passed away. In this video, Rabbi Sachs responds to the question of questions. Here in this video that I'd like to share with you, Rabbi Sachs in his own voice, responding to that ultimate question as to why bad things happen to good people. And it uh, comes along here in uh, the most meaningful way. So let's uh, listen to how he puts it himself. It's a beautiful quote. And you just did. I actually, I, we started off, I started off telling you about my parents and it just comes to mind. I remember my father said to us that the last time he saw you, you remembered my mother had asked you a question, why do bad things happen to good people? And you said to my father, tell your wife, I still don't have an answer for her. I was wondering if you had any more insight. Yes, I do actually. Oh. God does not want us to understand why bad things happen to good people. Because if we ever understood, we would be forced to accept that bad things happen to good people. And God does not want us to accept those bad things. He wants us not to understand so that we will fight against the bad and the injustices of this world. And that is why there is no answer to that question because God has arranged that we shall never have an answer. And so we have the first lesson from Rabbi Sachs, the lesson of critical followership, that we are expected as followers to challenge our teachers. We are expected to challenge our leaders if done in the correct way, and even to challenge Hashem. Hashem expects us to ask those questions. Hashem expects us to have that struggle we aren't expected to passively accept everything in the world and our circumstances. 
However challenging, wrestling is part of what it means to be a Jew. I'd now like to move on to some other messages with you from Rabbi Sachs from these very same psukim in this week's parasha. Lesson two. Here Rabbi Sachs teaches us about conflict resolution from this mitzvah. This mitzvah isn't easy at all. It's telling us that if there's somebody who's clearly disappointed, upset you, angered you to the extent that you might even hate them, you're not allowed to keep quiet. Now that's very difficult. However, he brought the example from the book of Breshit of the danger of what can happen if people are unable to speak to each other. Here in, uh, that's actually probably source number, not source number one, but that's not the end of the world. Here from the book of Breshit, we're told that our forefather Jacob loved his son Joseph more than the rest of his children. Because he was a child of his old age, whatever that means. And he made him that special clerk. Now, how do the brothers respond? The brothers saw that Yosef was more beloved than the rest of them. And as a result, they hated him. They were unable to speak with Yosef. They were unable to speak peacefully to him. And they were unable to even speak with him in order to achieve shalom. And here Rabbi Sachs brings the teaching of Rabbi Yohanan Ibishitz, who said, This is the key challenge. The key root cause of every machloket, she'ein migi'in l'chlal hidabrut, that people can't even speak to each other. She'ein ha'echad rotzei lazin l'zolato, that one doesn't want to listen to the other, or l'habino and understand them. Ilu yadu b'nei ha'adam l'idabe b'neihem, if people just knew how to speak between themselves, how to speak to each other, ha'yu nechokhim al pirov, she'ein lahem klal al ma'al ariv, they would discover, in general, in almost all cases, that there's nothing to argue about in the first place. The whole tragedy of Yosef and his brothers, that entire story and everything which happened as a result of it could have been avoided if they could simply speak to each other. And so Rabbi Sachs teaches, if someone has done us harm, it is natural to feel aggrieved. What then are we to do in order to fulfill the command, do not hate your brother in your heart? It's a challenge from the Torah. Don't hate somebody in your heart. So then what's the answer? The Torah's answer is speak, converse, challenge, remonstrate. It may be that the other person had a good reason for doing what he did. Or it may be that he was acting out of malice in which case our remonstration will give him, if he so chooses, the opportunity to apologize. And we should then forgive him. In either case, talking it through is the best way of restoring a broken relationship. And so the Torah tells us, do not hate your fellow in your heart. Rather, open up, tell them how you feel. Have that difficult conversation, overcome that barrier, whatever the barrier may be, to prevent you from having that conversation. The Torah is saying, have that conversation. It is the power of speech in order to resolve that conflict. And nearly all conflicts could be resolved if people were simply prepared to speak to each other and to listen. The third lesson, the third theme which I've seen recurring in Rabbi Sachs's teachings on this section of Parashat Kedoshim is what I call realistic expectations. You see, these could be very lofty goals for us in this parasha of Kedoshim, which is just filled with expectations of us in particular, these expectations of not hating others, of loving others. Some of us might feel that these concepts are simply too ideal or too lofty or too difficult for us to achieve. But look at how Rabbi Sachs talks about these great ideals in a way which are just so relevant and so practical for those of us who 
may not view themselves as being absolutely righteous. I'm sure that all of you are pure tzaddikim and everybody watching the recording afterwards is an absolutely righteous individual. But for people like me who aren't perfectly righteous, I find these to be empowering and reassuring words. And Rabbi Sachs writes as follows. The inner logic of the two verses in our Sedra is therefore this. Love your neighbor as yourself, but not all neighbors are lovable. What a statement, what a realistic reflection on the human condition. There are those who, out of envy or malice, have done you harm. I do not therefore command you to live as if you were angels, without any of the emotions natural to human beings. The Torah is not telling us to be robots or to lack humanity. I do, however, forbid you to hate. That is why when someone does you wrong, you must confront the wrongdoer. Rabbi Sachs frames these tremendous ideals in very realistic terms that were not being called upon to be angels, but within our non-angelic, lowly human state. There are still things that we can do and we still don't have to hate. And therefore the Torah gives us a guide of how to deal with this situation. And it's telling us, this is what you should do. Talk to other people, confront the wrongdoer. Either it'll change your understanding of the situation, that you were wrong to be upset with them in the first place, or perhaps it will change their understanding and they will learn to do things better. Similarly elsewhere, Rabbi Sachs wrote the same message. What is so impressive about the Torah is that it both articulates the highest of high ideals and at the same time speaks to us as human beings. If we were angels, it would be easy to love one another, but we are not. An ethic that commands us to love our enemies without any hint as to how we are to achieve this is simply unlivable. Instead, the Torah sets out a realistic program by being honest with one another, talking things through, we may be able to achieve reconciliation. Not always, to be sure, but often. How much distress and even bloodshed might be spared if humanity heeded this simple command. Rabbi Sachs has taken these greatest of great ideals and let us know that these are very, very relevant to us, all of us, in our day-to-day -day lives. And the Torah tells us how to achieve it which is to have those conversations. So far, we have seen three different lessons from the teachings of Rabbi Sachs, from this one phrase in what he calls the apex of the Torah, Vayikra chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. We've seen the importance of critical followership, how the requirement to challenge others and to remonstrate with others extends to our teachers, to our leaders. Nobody is too great to be criticized and nobody is too lowly to offer that criticism if it is done and it must always be done in an appropriate and graceful way. You know, the Gemara has statements questioning whether anybody in our generation is talking about their generation, how much more so this generation. If anybody knows how to rebuke at all, or if anybody knows how to receive rebuke and listen to rebuke, Nevertheless, when we have such mitzvot in the Torah at such a central location, we can't ignore them, but view them as Rabbi Sachs does, as practical guidance for our day-to-day -day lives. In addition to the lesson of critical followership, we've seen the power of speech. Yosef and his brothers, the Torah tells us explicitly the real challenge there beyond the circumstances and the jealousy and the dreams and the gifts and all the perhaps mistakes which were made along the way. The Torah Kel tells us the crux of the challenge, which was they could not speak peacefully with each other. Speech, having that conversation, is so powerful in conflict resolution. Furthermore, in the third lesson we've seen so far, the Torah is speaking to us on a very realistic level. It is acknowledging that sometimes as humans, we may have an inclination to hate. It's acknowledging that it's not so straightforward to love other people, 
that we need a bit of help sometimes to love certain individuals, to deal with certain challenging people or challenging situations. The Torah does not expect us to be angels. Hashem has enough angels in heaven. Hashem and his Torah want us to be human beings, and it gives us a guide as human beings how to interact with other human beings. The final thing I'd like to share with you is a different verse from the same chapter. And that is because I believe that Rabbi Sachs would not want us to discuss his teachings on Vayikra chapter 19 without mentioning the other mitzvah to love in the very same chapter. It is certainly less well-known. It is less famous. And it doesn't roll off the tongue the same way Kamocha does. Nevertheless, as Rabbi Sachs is going to point out, if we look at how often this appears in the Torah, it is something which he simply cannot ignore. And it appears later in Vayikra chapter 19, over here where it says, V'chiyagur itcha ger ba'artzachem, lo tonu oto. When the ger, the stranger, the convert, lives with you in your land, you shall not oppress him. Ke'ezrach mikem ye'lachem ha'ger ha'gar itchem. That stranger who sojourns with you shall be like a citizen amongst you. Ve'ahavta lo kamocha. It's the same wording as Vayikra. Chapter 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're told here about the stranger. Ve'ahavta lo kamocha. You must love him as yourself. Why? Ki gerim he'yitem be'eretz mitzrayim. Because you yourselves were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ani Hashem elokechem. I am the Lord, your God. There are two mitzvot to love in the same chapter. The famous one, love your neighbor as yourself. But later in the same chapter, we're also told about loving the stranger. And as Rabbi Sachs points out in Faith in the Future, the final source I'd like to share with you in source 78, sorry, page 78 in Faith in the Future. The Hebrew Bible contains the great command you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this has often been taken as the basis of biblical morality. But it is not. It is only part of it. The Jewish sages noted that on only one occasion does the Hebrew Bible command us to love our neighbor. But in 37 places, it commands us to love the stranger. The Gemara has different calculations as to exactly how many times, but it's dozens of occasions where the Torah tells us to love the stranger. Our neighbor is the one we love because he is like ourselves. The stranger is the one we are taught to love precisely because he is not like ourselves. And that is a recurring theme in the Torah. And it is a recurring theme in Rabbi Sachs' teachings as well that when we're talking about loving our neighbor and so much attention is given, and rightly so, to the mitzvah of loving your neighbor as yourself, this mitzvah was certainly, according to our sages like Hillel and Rabbi Akiva and others, such a central and such an important part of the Torah. Nevertheless, on dozens of other occasions, the Torah tells us, love the stranger. And if we're gonna talk about loving others, we cannot allow our discussion to end within our own circles, within those who are similar to us. Although sometimes loving those who are similar to you can be more challenging than loving those who are different to you. But our love, which we need to achieve, needs to extend beyond our immediate circle, beyond the natural circle of those who are similar to us, beyond our neighbors, but through to the stranger and outside those circles as well. And so we've looked at four lessons from Rabbi Sachs, from the apex of the Torah, the importance of critical followership, the importance of speech and having those conversations in order to achieve conflict resolution, how the Torah speaks to us as human beings, not as angels, with realistic expectations, and the importance of loving the stranger, a recurring theme in the Torah and a recurring theme in the writings and teachings of Rabbi Sachs. And if there's one time in the year where it is appropriate for us to dwell on such things and to talk about achieving greater love, greater understanding, conflict resolution and unity, 
certainly within the Jewish people, it is at this time of year, during Sfirat Omer, between Pesach and Shavuot, the time when we mourn the loss of the students of Rabbi Akiva, who tragically died because they did not show sufficient respect to each other, because they were unable to internalize these messages. It is now our role and responsibility to learn those messages ourselves, to understand the importance of these things, to take on the legacy of Rabbi Sachs, to perpetuate the, Reb, the legacy of Rabbi Sachs, to translate these great ideals into reality and into part of our everyday lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob Danny. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, next week, we're going to be ha having uh, Rob Ari Khan, Rabbi Ari Khan, uh, joining us, talking about, as uh, you just mentioned about Rabbi Akiva, uh, Rabbi Danny. So uh, Rabbi Khan will be speaking about, was Rabbi Akiva successful with his students? So that's next week. Uh, same time, looking forward to seeing everyone there. In the meantime, wishing everyone again, Chodesh Tov and Chag Atzmahut Sameach.